Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank, thank you for coming. Uh, just um, before we commence, and on behalf of Macquarie and, and myself, uh, I'd like to commence the uh, proceedings by acknowledging uh, the Gadigal people of the Uora Nation for letting us um, present on their land and pay my respects to the elders, um, past and present, and in respects to any Indigenous members who happen to be here today. Yeah. Now, on that note, I, I, know, I think I know there's quite a diverse, diverse number of people here from lots of different backgrounds. Some are actually from the finance industry and actually some of you aren't, which is really good to see. I will try and put a little bit of everything for everyone. I'm guessing some of you, particularly those other ones that are from sovereign wealth funds, um, are here for investment tips and strategies rather than my scintillating regressions. Um, and some of you are academics, so I'll try and please all of you if I can. Just by, by way of background, um, just by way of background, so I'm um, not, oh, I, I should say I'm an, I am an academic, but not a full-time academic. Um, so I've come 20 years from industry. I did a PhD uh, 20 years ago, and my background has been in as a principal of a private infrastructure business, I've been a global equity PM, and most recently I was running the investment strategy team at New Zealand Super. Um, and so the first half of this is essentially about what my job description was. Um, and the second half is a different way of looking at a particular investment strategy. I'll go through a case study of a particular hedge fund strategy um, for everybody. Uh, now, this is, now, this is an extended version of a uh, presentation I did at a uh, conference in May, at, I think, which Tig Tan over here runs. So if you happen to be coming across um, I3, it's an excellent institute. Uh, and if you can get involved in their programs, that's definitely worthwhile. Now, what I'm going to cover today is, as I said, you know, I don't know if the draw card is getting a free investment tip or uh, finding out about a particular investment strategy or the academic part, but I'll start off by describing uh, effectively how a sovereign wealth fund is different. Um, and re the reality is you're, you're working from the same pool of human capital. So yeah, we're not, the, at, and I always used to say this to the team, um, you've got the same behavioral biases as anybody else. Thanks, all right. Um, you've got the same behavioural bias as anybody else. As human beings, you've got the same horizons as anybody else. How can you actually operate in a different way which lets you avoid some of the things or pitfalls um, that other investors face and do that in a way that allows you to extract some sort of alpha in a systematic manner? Um, and so that's, that's where I'll start off. And then I'll use a very specific case study of a strategy which... Um, is available primarily to uh, deep and liquid long horizon investors, but it's not exclusive to them. You could take that philosophy and actually apply it yourself. Um, so the starting point, let's, let's just, I'll describe, I guess, yeah, the obvious differences between your average investor or institutional investor and a sovereign fund. Um, but yeah, as we know, the average investor has a truncated horizon. Even the big industry funds, um, despite the amount of capital going through them, some of them are actually um, can predict reasonably when their capital outflows will peak, particularly if you have a demographic period, a pyramid. Um, and they definitely have limited liquidity. And, and the other problem that we've seen is that risk tolerance varies through time. And we know this. That's why we, we view that markets become overpriced or underpriced at different points in time. Um, now, if we think about a sovereign fund, and the one I used to work for in New Zealand, um, was designed to facilitate universal pensions. Um, our fund didn't, uh, was not paying out anything for about 25, 30 years. And the fund in New Zealand um, would not peak till 2080. Okay, so we had no redemptions for at least 20 years and we weren't going to peak for another uh, 60 plus years. So it put us in a very unique position where we could definitely say we had long horizon. The government couldn't take money away from us. That was in statute. Um, so we had very ample liquidity and, and a fairly certain liquidity profile. 
Um, and we had this thing which we described as a stable risk aversion. What it meant was that we essentially you could, we could write out the cycle. Despite the same human beings working in this place, if you, can, if you can create a culture where people look through their career horizon, and that's very important, yeah, create a culture where people look through their career horizon, you're able to invest in things that do look through the cycle. All right? And that's, that's a very difficult one, as we know. Um, and it's been a cause of many, um, I, well, many poor strategies, let's say. Um, and then you've got other, other obvious advantages or endowments. So whether it's governance or tax, um, yeah, as a sovereign fund, you don't always pay tax um, or access to intellectual property, you have these other endowments. But what it meant was that you, you were a fairly unique class of investor. Um, and so what we did was that, um, and this is my predecessors and predecessors in the asset allocation team said, we, we're a fairly unique class of investor. Why would we invest as someone else? So a lot of sovereign funds, when they started, um, they, they pretty much picked up a standard balance fund template and said, yeah, we want diversification. If we want diversification, we'll invest in a few different asset classes. Um, but what New Zealand did and a lot of other sovereign funds did was say, look, that actually doesn't make sense for us because we are different from the average investor because of all those reasons. And so we said, we don't need to have this balanced <coughs> asset allocation approach. Um, so if you think about why you need diversification, it's our only free lunch, but we only need diversification because we either don't have ample liquidity or we can't ride out a cycle. Okay. So then it's because of that lack of liquidity that you need to find some sort of diversification. And, and there's a hope there. Um, there's a, and there's some people that teach PMV and as, asset allocation in this class. There's a hope there that the correlations will save you or the lack of correlations will save you. Okay. And, and as we saw in the GFC, when the markets converged to a beta one, um, that didn't really save us too much, unless you happen to be in gold or cash. Um, now, as, as a sovereign fund, what we said was we, we don't actually need that. We have the capability to write out any cycle or better than any other market participants. So as the marginal owner of capital in those circumstances, you should be picking up the highest risk assets throughout any cycle. So we said, if that's the case, we don't need to pay away return or risk through necessarily chasing diversification. What we should find is those asset classes which um, we can depend on most in the long term, uh, where the risk premium or our beliefs are the easiest to, to achieve. And so we dropped um, uh, a, the balanced fund approach essentially and went to this concept of a reference portfolio. Um, and for those that aren't familiar with that, a reference portfolio is simply choosing a set of assets that are very transparent, very simple, low cost, passive, where essentially you're making as few assumptions as possible. So even on the left side, to get that diversified portfolio, you've made a pretty critical assumption that those things have low correlations in a downturn and it'll allow you to ride things out. And as we've experienced, that's not always the case. In the reference portfolio, if we can live through that, then the, ease, the simplest belief we had was that risk is rewarded and equity risk is greater than credit risk. And that was the most simple portfolio that you could have um, where it was low cost, essentially we got it for almost nothing. So we could replicate that for almost nothing. It's your theoretical or practical five person portfolio. Um, and it's the one on an 80 year horizon with all our knowledge in finance that we can depend on the most. Um, so, and to give you an example of what that could look like, uh, these are uh, different sovereign funds or, or funds that use reference portfolios. So, Canadian Pension Fund, we've got uh, Singapore's GIC there, um, as well as NZ Super. And so, essentially, you'll see that they, they all come down to just one or two, two well, not one, uh, two or three simple asset classes. And it's equities, fixed income. Um, and you almost always get away from your home country bias. Um, you don't have private equity, you don't have cash, you don't have real estate. Um, and, and the view there is that the reference portfolio does a few things. As I said, one, it allows you to invest with a horizon where you have to make as few assumptions as possible. So if you think about risk, every time you make an assumption, you're taking on risk. So if we can invest in a way 
where we had few assumptions, then that should give us a better outcome than the average person or the average investor. Um, the other thing it set was a fairly clear cut uh, cost of capital or opportunity cost um, where there was no argument. Um, and what it allowed you to do was if you believe in those risk premia, you weren't in a business of bucket filling. Okay, so effectively we dropped bucket filling. So everybody's heard the argument of their managers or whoever where they said, oh look, we had to invest because we've got this allocation, our mandate wouldn't let us hold cash. Um, even though we think it's expensive, our clients told us, or we have this big strategic asset allocation. Okay, so everybody's heard those arguments. You've got that no excuse in a reference portfolio because what it meant was that apart from equities and bonds, which are the simplest risk premium, you weren't forced to buy anything. And that ability to do nothing is actually worth something. So this, this whole concept of... Um, and people use this excuse in the GFC, we had to buy it even though we thought it was expensive because in, a, in our mandate, well, you could have given the capital back. Um, you don't have that. And so we, that was to us, for us, we'd call that an endowment or a competitive advantage. The ability to just port things back to the very long run, no, few assumption portfolio was a significant advantage. Um, as an equity PM, some days I'd walk in and say, do nothing today. Um, do nothing today. There's too much noise or you don't know enough about this. And it was actually something I had to remind myself as an equity stock picker. Um, but this is the nice thing, is if I felt the markets were expensive, um, uh, or I felt that there weren't any opportunities or things were too close um, to their cost of capital, I'd say, look, we're just not gonna do anything. We'll port things back to the reference portfolio. So, so that was a significant advantage. Um, the other thing it allows you to do is, um, as I said, it, it allows you to make a statement and accurately target the risk. So the reference portfolio, and this is everybody's, well, most people here are in super here for the Aussies in the room. It's the portfolio that gives you the greatest certainty of hitting your target allocation over the long run. Um, and so this, this was, uh, again, as I said, an advantage that we would have had that you wouldn't have had if your horizon was shorter, yet less than the 60 years that we had. Um, but there's a catch, you know, the catch was that it's an equilibrium concept. So it only <coughs> makes, you have to have a couple of beliefs to run this. Um, and, and the, um, so you have to have a couple of core beliefs to run this. Um, as I said, the equilibrium concept is the one, is you have, yeah, it's a long run portfolio. So you have to be actually <laughs> be confident that equities will be rewarded. Um, and the horizon isn't 10 years. So we saw this, if you've looked, followed US markets, through peso crisis, ruble crisis, tech wreck, and GFC, you made nothing over 15 year horizon. So 15 year horizon really isn't a sufficiently long run horizon to take this kind of approach. Um, um, because over that period, you really made nothing in equities. Um, so the idea of equilibrium is very long run. I don't know what that is, but 80 years is probably closer to what the mark. Now, this is where um, effectively, I guess, I came in. If you've decided you're not gonna bucket fill and you're gonna drop down to just two asset classes, equities and fixed income, we had no cash, well, marginal amounts of cash, um, and then you kind of start from a blank page, the question becomes, what do I buy? Um, so what do we buy? And that was essentially my job. So I ran the investment strategy team at New Zealand Super. Um, and what we did was we were looking for any, in an unconstrained way, so we weren't forced to bucket fill and we were told very explicitly, if you can't find any opportunities, that's fine, you're not gonna get fired over one, two, three years. So that, that's good, that was a relief. Um, but our job was to look for opportunities, any asset class, <laughs> any market, um, effective anywhere. Um, and all, all our, all our uh, mandate was is to look for something that was gonna, uh, that was mispriced. A dislocation or a systematic mispricing, a liquidity mismatch. Look for anything that was not going to earn its cost of capital. Preferably higher, lower is not a problem if you could short that asset. Okay, so our mandate was essentially to look for anything that could, uh, that wasn't earning its cost of capital, and preferably higher rather than lower. Um, uh, and the strategies we had was we had about 40, 20 were live, um, but it, it went from everywhere from uh, a 
effectively a CDS convergence trade between Spanish and Italian bonds, which is not long horizon. It was, it was a big short Brexit trade. Um, to uh, effectively instituting uh, an equity factors program, which is definitely long horizon and it's not suitable to anyone that has anything less than 10, 15 years um, of liquidity available. Okay, so we went for everywhere, everywhere from a CDS trade around Brexit to something where we believe the premier, you couldn't be confident in collecting on anything less than a 10 year horizon um, and, and the whole range in between. So that unconstrained go anywhere alpha opportunity was fantastic. And the, and the flip side was the, the having the choice not to have to invest was probably just as equally strong. Um, so it allowed us to sit back and look at things in a uh, fairly independent, the critically minded way. Um, and so that was, as I said, that the team I ran uh, was essentially charged with finding those alpha opportunities of individual slices. Um, now, as I said, th there's good and bad with that. Um, you're assuming that you can port things back to the reference portfolio, which means you have to be confident in those long-term asset class returns. Um, you have to be confident that there's be gonna be some sort of mean reversion in a reasonable time horizon or within your time horizon. Um, and so you're not taking systematic uh, drawdowns of capital, which within equities and fixed income, well, sorry, within equities and bonds, you could probably believe, but not in fixed income as much. Um, and the other one is you have to believe that the liquidity you had would allow you to actually execute on that. And as, as I said, as a sovereign fund, that was not too big an issue. But if we think about those first three, there's no reason any fund that uh, you're part of or a member of couldn't do those things if you had a sufficient liquidity model. Um, and that's a discussion for another day. But it is possible for people to take that philosophy if they have a, a uh, sufficient liquidity model and the governance to go around that. Um, and that was probably the, the, f the, the other key advantage that we had is we could only do what we could do if we had a strong governance and culture where we felt that um, we weren't gonna feel particular, particular pressure by giving assets back to the reference portfolio, uh, which is like giving capital back to your clients you're a manager. Um, and as I said, the, the advantage of having our team was we could sit back independent from any asset class and we say we're going to take this to zero without fear or favour. So that was um, the philosophy behind what we did um, and the advantages and disadvantages. Now, um, what I'll do now is I'll give you a case example. I should have mentioned I'm happy to take questions anywhere during the presentation. Um, Anyway, during the presentation, but, uh, yep. How much is the uh, 35 billion, 35, oh, it's, sorry, closer to 40 billion today now. So I finished up in November and I think they've done quite a bit since I left. Um, yeah, yeah, I should, uh, now I forgot to mention, 40 billion, uh, we had 20 live strategies out of 40, you know, so 20 were benched, 65% um, were in the reference portfolio, 35% were active within, mostly my sleeves, um, and, but that varied, okay, and that varied. Um, so that you think about if you're going to invest in the portfolio, yeah. in terms of how we thought about those? Or? Yeah. yeah, so I guess I'll give you a live example, but the, the key thing is, I mean, our biggest assets were timber, cows, um, farmland, cows, um, and then a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, no, no sheep, cows. <laughs> cows. Um, <laughs> lots and lots of cows. Um, uh, look, it, it is, well, that did, this, that's a really good example. So the, the cows we held because we, we, they gave us diversification, even though I told you we didn't need diversification. Um, so why did we do that? We thought two things. There's a thematic where we thought um, ag and dairy would be mispriced. Um, so that's one. <coughs> What we did was we're not going to ignore diversification. So if we took on something like farmland, um, which was low beta to the rest of the reference portfolio, it's not like it didn't give us an advantage. What it did was it allowed you to use more risk elsewhere. So we weren't going to, we weren't, philosophically, you're not going to pay for diversification for the sake of it because we didn't need it. 
but if diversification gave you a free risk budget, it allowed you to take more risk elsewhere. And so I, we, we, we've never mapped the benefit of that in, in working out how much of our alpha, um, and yeah, we had about 100 basis points of alpha um, during that period, but we never mapped that. But so we weren't, so what, what it allows us to do is rather than being a price taker, diversification in that sense gave us free risk, so to speak, to use elsewhere and helped us earn that excess alpha in other parts of the portfolio. Um, the philosophy behind how we come up with energy, people ask, okay, you've got an open mandate, you can look at anything. It's not as nice as it sounds because the problem is, well, actually there's too many things to look at. Um, and so you have a pecking order of things. Um, and the pecking order of things is, for us, is are we investing in something where you can observe, touch, feel, and understand the mispricing? Um, the debates where we have said, I think the EPS is going to be higher, just, you just did not get off the floor. That just did not get off the floor. The debates where we said there's a mispricing because there's a lack of buyers, that something as simple as that, or there's an, and this will be the example I'll give, there's a different risk premium that isn't properly measured or captured, that's the type of things that worked well for us. Because, it can, because one, philosophically, it allowed you to make an investment without using opinions. It was, it was and, well, sorry, I've got to get, it was premised on something that you could measure more tangibly. Um, and it was consistent with the rest of our endowments being, we're using our liquidity, we're using our horizon and the like. And so, what did that mean? A large portion of the portfolio was long-term, but not always. A lot of it looks similar to what other people had. So we've got a fixed income portfolio, but it's very different. We could cherry pick the things that we like. Um, an active fixed income, I should say. Um, we had a real assets team. We didn't hold that because we needed diversification. Um, at the time, most of our assets were undertaken. We felt that you could earn a sufficient liquidity premium. Um, but as the liquidity premium went down, their budget went down. Um, so that's maybe a separate discussion, but what, what it means is that you need two things. You need a very strong cost of capital framework. So um, when I arrived, I used to set the cost of capital for all the assets in the fund. Um, and then you need a very strong risk budgeting framework to say, okay, well, that's a cost of capital. How much do I own? Um, when you're unconstrained, you, don't own, you still don't own 100% of the highest risk um, or highest sharp ratio asset. So those are quite critical, which I haven't really touched on. But it's important that as part of the governance that you have a very strong process of measuring things fairly if you're going to take this long run horizon. Because the drawback is if things go wrong and you've taken all these long run horizon investments, people have left and it's somebody else's problem. So that's, that's very important that you set up a framework that minimises that kind of behaviour. Which goes into uh, this one, and just to wake you up, I thought I'd show you a short video. So both of you are excited to die in the dark tonight. Yes, very Yeah, too. I will um, guide you in the dark, mm -hmm. okay? So just put your hands on the shoulders like that, uh -huh. okay? And then we can actually go. I hope discovering new flavor. I'm actually quite curious to see um, what impact the darkness will have on my taste. Everybody is up for uh, lamb, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Let's stop. I don't think it was a potato. No, I don't think so. But that was a total surprise. Well, this experience was simply amazing. It was uh, something I've never done before. Great experience. Surprising. Me? Surprising. I would say, like, sensual. The Giro Montez Aurora. Apologies, I'm showing that at lunchtime, and I'll, I'll, I'll make specific endeavours to try and get this catered next time. Um, 
But uh, so you're probably wondering why why on earth did I sell you that besides waking everyone up? Um, but I'm going to talk about a uh, specific uh, hedge fund strategy. But if, just think about uh, if I relate it to hedge fund strategies. Um, yeah, how many people who who are in the industry have you have you um, had a situation where it's a little bit like you thought you were getting lamb, but you found out you're eating duck? Um, potentially, um, you've invested in effectively what's a black box. Um, how many people in the investment strategies want to hear the word surprising? Uh, not many, and definitely not essential. So, um, so well, I don't know about the relationships you have with your managers, but that's something that we definitely avoided. So, if, if I think about the whole hedge fund space, um, it's a little bit like eating in the dark. Well, it was like, it still is like that, I should say. Um, and the reason people owned hedge funds was that it provided them a low correlation diversification benefit with hopefully a high return at a high fee. Okay? But, as I've said, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the reason I showed you that video, um, is that um, the, the example I'll give is the evolution of hedge funds were effectively black boxes um, with the hope that you'd get an idiosyncratic risk um, and you allowed them huge latitude to invest in in, in fairly unconstrained ways, and they charged you quite, a, well, not appropriately, they charged you quite high fees for that. Um, they engaged in high leverage, and really the, the term correlation wasn't part of the lexicon of hedge funds. Um, and so what, what's happened over time is there is still a little bit like that, but um, if you look at a hedge fund today, they are becoming much more systematic. Those old ones the, the, where you've got effectively a hero fund uh, less and less, or they're not getting as much capital. Um, they, so they still tar they're targeting more cash plus returns. Um, fees are still kind of high, but they're coming down. Leverage varies, but it's lower than in the past. It's just not as available. Um, and they'll tell you they're still uncorrelated. Now, the key thing there is there's a push and pull. Um, the push is that they've worked out from a business perspective, there are better alpha opportunities by being less um, idiosyncratic and more systematic. And that's partly the availability, availability of data and technology, which just wasn't possible even five, ten years ago. Um, and this is the example I'm going to go through now. Um, and there's a pull. Um, clients, um, such as, and we know there's a lot of funds here, clients are asking for cash plus strategies. You know, they, they want the high returns but without the variability. So they're forced to try and create some magic around that where you provide a, a fairly uh, predictable return stream yet somehow high and uncorrelated, which is the holy grail of investing. And so they've constructed different strategies around that. I'll talk about one which isn't necessarily systematic but is increasingly becoming one, uh, which is um, a part of... Uh, event-driven strategies or a part of risk arbitrage, which is called merger arbitrage. And I'll give you this live example of the one we looked at and how you can break that up. Um, and, and then I'll give you some examples in other strategies where you can take that philosophy. So merger arb um, is simply where a, a, a hedge fund buys stocks post-announcement. So you're not trying to guess something's going to get taken over. Um, you're buying it post-announcement after the jump. So this is an example from March. Surtex um, does liver treatments. Um, it had an offer of 28 from, it was trading at whatever, 18, 16, and it popped. Um, and what happens is typically um, share prices don't always pop straight to the target price or the offer price, I should say, because there's a risk that the, uh, the acquisition doesn't go ahead. So people buy this, and there's often a gap, and the return is 4 to 10% annualised. Um, now, as a former equity PM, I would sell into this. Um, why would I sell into this? Because I've got, you know, why would I? I've got this small cash plus return over a period of time, um, and as an equity PM, my benchmark is equities. So if I... If, there's, if I'm getting this cash plus type return and I've got an equities benchmark, it, I'm kind of guaranteeing negative alpha within my portfolio. Plus, that pop might have effectively, um, as an equity PM, that pop might have effectively been sufficient where I would bank my alpha for the year. 
Um, so as an equity PM, you would tend to sell this, sell into this. Um, now on the flip side, why would anyone buy this is the question. You, you're getting um, a small cash plus return, and as we know, if the takeover fails, you're going to go a lot of a long way back down. And so, so the tricky thing is the people that invest in this, um, and as I said, it's offered by hedge funds, um, and it is a strategy we ended up doing. Um, the reason they buy this is because if here it should offer you some form of lower risk than the markets, but higher risk than fixed income in theory. And so the left-hand side is your win-loss ratio. So that's the Russell 3000 um, in the US, so broader than the S&P. Um, and you can see up months, down months. Um, so you can see the up month or the win-loss or up month, down month ratio for merger ARB is better. And on the right-hand side is the number of completed versus cancelled deals. So the reason the, you might like to do this if you don't have an equity benchmark is you get something that's got uh, a beta to the market of less than 0.2. Um, correlation is 42% as I, up there. Um, and you've got 85 to 95% success rate of deals closing. Okay, so, so going back, that 85 to 95% of the time you will achieve your, the target price or the acquisition or higher if there's a counter bidder. bidder. Five, ten percent of the time, it'll drop down. And so you think, okay, I've got a low beta strategy. Um, that four to ten percent allows me to get better than high yield, um, better than fixed income return, um, and it's different. And it's low duration. So deals close between uh, six to 12 months on average. And so you've got this hedge fund strategy here where you go, well, that's actually, if I systematically buy those, then I can achieve better than credit returns most of the time. Okay, is, so why wouldn't I always do this? Um, now, for the, for the closet statisticians, I, yeah, that's not a normal distribution if you're doing your eyeball kurtosis. That's not a normal distribution. Um, the problem is, as I said, sometimes deals fail, and so you're systematically going in and taking a below equity market return, um, and so effectively collecting a small premium for that, but when a deal fails, you've got this left skew. Um, so that's, sorry for those people over here, there's left skew here where you've got a fairly large tail. Um, and so what you're effectively doing is, that's why as an equity PM, I used to sell this, I'd bank, I'd bank it often. Um, but you've got this large left tail. So effectively, you're getting a cash plus premium for, a large, for the occasional left tail risk. Um, where you have a large drawdown. Um, so that's your classic collecting pennies before the steamroller trade. Okay, collecting pennies before the steamroller trade. So now this is, again, going back to what hedge funds are purporting. Yeah. If you haven't seen the steamroller in a while, it starts to look like it's a low correlation, fairly predictable cash flow that's better than fixed income, beats your credit uh, strategies, and it's uncorrelated. So it does look like the holy grail tra trade until the steamroller comes along. Um, unfortunately for us, in our first month, the steamroller hit us, but, but we recovered, luckily. Um, but what it means, though, is that um, what we did, what it meant for us was that what we wanted to understand when we looked at it was, okay, well, this trade looks too good to be true. What are we really paying for? Um, and as I said, there is this skew here, and we wanted to understand that better especially if, if a lot of funds are still charging you 2 and 20 for this simple cash plus trade. And so um, what we did was we, we started to break up the return series here. And we said, okay, in the pitch book, the PowerPoint presentation they show you, um, they show you a single factor model often. Um, and as I said, it's got a beta to the equity market to 0.2. So very low beta, very high success rate. Equity-like returns over the period that you've been able to measure it. Um, and, and it had an information ratio of one. So it looked like a very attractive strategy. Um, and, as I was, and as I said, they charged you 2 and 20. Well, most charged you 2 and 20 for. Um, but once you started breaking this down further, what we did is we ran multi-factor models. So we looked at, okay, well, this isn't just equity risk. You've got credit risk here. You've got cash risk. Um, here as well, <coughs> and you think about all the reasons why takeovers will fail, and we started breaking this down a little bit. 
Um, and so we said, as we started getting more refined analysis, what we worked out is we could explain more and more of the returns. Um, and the apparent alpha I've measured here as the information ratio can consistently drew down. So what we worked out is I can identify uh, more than half of the source of the returns um, for, and for which I was paying 2% for plus a 20% carry. Um, and the proper risk adjusted attractiveness fell from, as I said, an information ratio of 1 down to 0.4. So the attractiveness level fell by half once we just split up the returns and looked at it beyond just equity and credit markets. So I'll explain what we did uh, just really briefly. So uh, I go back to my analogy. As an um, equity PM, I used to sell this uh, because, as I said, I had an equity benchmark. Often it would mean negative, guaranteed negative alpha, 95 or 90% guaranteed negative alpha for an equity PM um, if they had an equity benchmark. So I'd sell it. So what I was effectively doing was for the people that were systematically buying these, either hedge funds or unconstrained investors, they were providing me liquidity um, and providing me effectively with a form of insurance and liquidity at the same time. Effectively, I was putting, it was like a put option. <coughs> so I was putting to them my stock. And so what we, te what, we, uh, what we tested was split this up between equity beta, <laughs> credit beta, and vol, vol premium, volatility premium. So the best way to think about volatility premium is if you systematically sold options, um, and you didn't hedge those back to their underlying asset classes, um, over the very long run, you'd, you'd collect a different type of return premium, apart from equity beta and credit beta, you'd collect a volatility beta, if you will, or a volatility premium. And, and what we worked out was that the returns we were getting, we could get if a large amount of that, you could see the relative size of the boxes, um, the, the, a large amount of the returns we, we could get by systematically doing the same things. A lot of the return was just beta, but a lot of that was from option selling as well, if we, were, if we wanted to do that systematically. Um, and, and a large amount was, as I said, provision and liquidity. And when you've got a cash plus strategy with large fees, those slices that take away, you're starting to think that marginal percent of the alpha that I get, which is really those two things, the volatility um, and the alpha part, that's a large fee for really not much additional return that I could get from actual broad markets. Um, and so as I said, we ran the multi, well, I've done this, I shouldn't say we, this is my desktop analysis I did thanks to Macroyini um, <coughs> at the start of the year. Um, and so if you think about this another way, you go, the cheap part, sorry, a large portion of the returns any investor could get, um, investing in the equity and credit markets um, and paying fees and giving up liquidity, anybody could really do that. And what we wanted to work out was the additional true alpha, is it worthwhile doing? Um, and what we wanted to test is can we target that alpha? Um, and as you've got more data and as there are more ETFs, um, so there's a volatility ETF, um, if you look up in the US, uh, based on the VIX, VXX, um, you can actually start to try and target the premium that hedge funds have traditionally bundled in their black box. And so what you're un doing is unbundling hedge fund strategies and making sure that you're not paying ex essentially exp uh, expensive fees for, for beta that you could otherwise get in some other way. Um, and so, so we worked out that the two bits that were useful to us, which was the, um, the vol premia, and the little bit that was left in alpha, um, the, even a simple desktop analysis I can run back in North Ride, you can get your R squares over 50%. So think, why did deals fail? Regulatory risk, cross-border risk, if they're stock or cash only. So you can run those models and, and start to whittle, whittle away a lot of that alpha. Um, and so what we're able to do as a long horizon investor is the more we could identify which parts of a return series are actually risk premia or replicable in some systematic way, the, the more we could avoid a high fee strategy. I mean, as I said, 
the availability of data, the availability of ETFs and swap contracts with banks, those things really have only really been um, truly useful to us in, for this philosophy, for this uh, approach in the last five or so years. And it's going to become increasingly available. Um, so what it means is that we can, two things. One, you, you know what you're paying for, so you're not eating in a dark room. Um, you know what you're paying for, and you can avoid paying too much um, by, by going, taking this philosophy. Um, now, if we take that, that's a very peculiar hedge fund strategy. We could actually, we apply this through, uh, or that lens, I should say, through a lot of our other um, strategies. So hedge funds are obviously the classic black box where you want to break down the return series. But even other simple things like royalty streams or other fixed income streams, um, so we have the question here on farmland. You can break down, what am I actually getting as a return here? Is it true diversifier or is it mostly bond-like returns or is it something else? You know, the question we had was, yeah, a lot of our milk was going to China. Am I really betting on China, for example, in an expensive, illiquid way? So, so we could break down something like royalties and say that's, that's charged. Um, they're fairly expensive because people think of those as idiosyncratic. Um, but... Uh, 80% of the royalty stream was just um, credit and fixed income beta. Um, so we could do that with royalties. Obviously, you do that in the factors space, um, which is smart or alt beta. It allowed us to avoid um, expensive index hugging stock pickers. Um, and even in asset allocation, um, to understand, say, something like risk parity, you want to avoid uh, buying high, selling low in a systematic way. Breaking down the return series into its constituents um, as I said, once you identify that, you could at least avoid high fees for, for beta streams. Um, but it also it allowed you to reconstitute your portfolio so that if you were missing one type of return stream um, or under allocated, then you could load back into that and that would free up risk capital to use elsewhere. Um, so the more you can synthesize down to those return streams, the more risk capital that was freed up for us. Or I'd give that back to the portfolio. Oh, yeah. So just unclear in my mind, if uh, I look at your asset allocation on your website that says you've got five percent allocated in emerging wild sites, does that mean you don't actually own any stocks that only take over in the shortening of the acquirer, and you've done it all through selling risks and buying credit, or do you actually have a merger? You're talking about New Zealand right? Super now, or? or yeah. So yeah. So yeah. does New Zealand Super actually have a traditional emerging wild type purpose? Yeah. Or It depends. It could be both. So I won't go into the details. Um, but if you see something there, some of it's internally ours, if you will. Well, I shouldn't say ours. I'm no longer part of New Zealand Super. Um, so some of it's internally part of the fund, um, and some of it's through managers. Um, the good thing about New Zealand Super is one of the most transparent organisations I've ever worked for. Or, or it, no, it is the most transparent organisation I've worked for, but one of the most in the, that I've ever seen. Um, you'll see the list of managers. And if you want, you can second guess what they're doing. Um, two strategies I could talk about is, say, factors in merger up. Um, it, even after doing all of that, we ended up using a manager. Um, one manager was your classic black box type. The other one was one where we got to shape the portfolio a little bit because we seeded them. Um, so there's, it's, it's, it's external, um, but we got to influence that portfolio. Um, in the other systematic strategies, there's one where effectively, effectively I wrote the black box and gave it to someone else to run. Um, so you won't, it's hard to tell from looking at the allocation. But if you, if, you, if you look at the allocations and you can look at all the managers and that's all public, you can second guess. Um, so, um, so as I said, recons, yep, sorry. Yeah, so this goes to, the, philosophically, you have to have a view that there were, the, the, I described it as an orphan trade. So as an equity holder, I go back to the equity PM hat, I used to sell these, sell these things, and a lot of equity holders do, so, but yeah, you didn't take my, my advice. Um, and then as a fixed income investor, you can't invest in equities, typically. 
So you had a fixed income type portfolio because it, once the announcement's been made, your risk is kind of the credit risk of the acquirer. So you had this fixed income risk, which couldn't be undertaken by credit people. Um, you had the equity people sell out because <coughs> the benchmark was typically too high. Um, and then you've only got hedge funds left. Um, that's very hard to measure, but if you think about the size of equity markets, credit markets and hedge funds, you did have, in our view, a disproportionate, um, uh, disproportionate supply curve coming out of that. And you can sort of measure that. Um, the other reason was, in the past, you, were cr you had a lot of banks buy this. They were the biggest, um, effectively the biggest participants in this. Um, and they did effectively crowd it out to get the returns. You had higher and higher leverage. What's happened over time is the nice thing is the investment banks aren't able to do this as much anymore because of um, restrictions they now face on capital. And so you're left with fewer hedge funds. The thing you don't have as a public, I guess, investor is, um, and you won't see, is the le le leverage. So you've got fewer hedge funds, but the argument is, well, is the same amount of capital there. What you need to measure is the leverage that they're using. And that only comes from knocking on doors, um, which we did. Oh, synthetic. Yeah, we, as I said, we ended up going through a manager. My, my dream was to run it systematically, and had I stayed at NZ, yeah, hopefully that we would have done it in two, three years. Um, there were a couple of systematic managers out there. We chose not to go with them for a bunch of reasons. Um, but as I said, uh, even, even coming back to Australia and running the desktop analysis in March, April this year, I was able to get the R squareds up to 50, 60%. Um, and some of those are fairly low hanging fruits where lawyers are involved, essentially. Good chance of failure. <laughs> um, lawyers are involved, cross-border deals where the regular, when I say lawyers, I mean kind of lawyers and regulators. Lawyers and regulators, cross-border deals, um, those things you're able to try and get to measure systematically. Um, the problem is some things you can't measure because some things are fairly, it, it's still hard to capture something systematically, which is, yeah, say so merge is a tough one because sometimes it depends on the board's philosophical bent. Like Unilever had a takeover offer and, and I think regardless of what the offer was, the board was going to say, yeah, Unilever is a preeminent organisation. It's been around for a long time. There's no way anyone's going to take us over. So you don't pick that up systematically. Um, and that's where we said, okay, well, this is why we ended up using a manager, the proverbial sometimes opening the newspaper trade occasionally beats the systematic one. Um, and in this case, it was hard to try and get that flavour of the board's recalcitrance, I guess. So, so systematically trying to work out how, are you going to have a recalcitrant board or a fairly open capital market board, we couldn't pick up. Um, but I think one day you can get there. One day. Um, I know um, there are AI systems that are... Um, effectively running around looking at words or speeches or language as the signal, which we never got to. We didn't have enough resources to do that. But that would be the next step for some of this um, to do systematically. Um, I think, so as I said, you can take that philosophic philosophy and apply it live on a lot of strategies um, besides systematic factors of beta to, to, to weed out your active expensive managers to weed out your hedge funds. Um, it works quite well in a lot of credit strategies. Um, so as I left, we were starting to think about systematic credit um, and worked on working on systematic, uh, effectively factors in credit strategies. Um, so it will work on that over time. Um, the difficulty is measuring liquidity in those markets where they're traded over the counter, but it's not impossible. So we did this. Um, we did do quite a lot of work on over-the-counter markets and getting data systematically. Um, for those hedge funds that are becoming more and more successful, their competitive advantage will be data in non-listed markets. Um, so going to your question, their competitive advantage is collect systematically collecting data that's not publicly available, but good enough to run analysis on, um, and which we couldn't replicate uh, ourselves because it's quite expensive. And that will be the new breed of hedge funds that I think it would succeed. Um, and so, so look, that's 
that's probably the, uh, the case example I'll, I'll give. Um, I'll just summarize that is for us, you know, we had the same people. It's not like you had a unique set of people that had long horizons. Um, we all you know, had our own concerns about career risk and longevity, et cetera. But we had a framework that allowed us to act differently from most investors. Um, and it gave us degrees of freedom, which definitely contributed to our alpha. Um, the availability of data, swaps, ETFs, contracts, um, that confluence of events which is happening now is going to allow us to do much more systematic strategies and you'll get a barbell. Um, a lot of things that are ex expensive black boxes, some of those will fall away because you'll find out that those are unusual sources of beta that you'll increasingly be able to access. Um, and then there'll be truly skilled, unique active stock pickers or hedge funds or those which have unique data that they've collected. And so everyone in the middle, in our view, will get thinned out. Um, and even if you can't do this, and as I said, in Merger Hub, we ended up going with a manager. Other strategies, we had our own black box, systematic, and others, we had a hybrid. But even where you're not executing on that behalf, uh, in that way, um, that philosophy certainly is useful because at least, you know, you're not eating uh, duck when you thought you had lamb, effectively. So you know what you're eating and you're not working in the dark. It's not a black box. So look, that's, um, that's um, my speech. Are there any other questions? Yep. Yeah, well, that was a live question. So we, um, I wasn't actually part of, the, I, was, well, sorry. I was part of the team that looked at ESG-related opportunities, um, the team that looked at it systematically across the fund. Um, in equity space, it's easy. It's, uh, if you've, we had a uh, negative and a positive, well, we didn't have a positive screen. We had a negative screen at the time. You run that same screen across your systematic portfolio. So that's, a, yeah, we have a bunch of things where we were targeting it a portfolio that was resilient to a two degree warming world. Um, that resulted in a number of screens and we'd run that through any systematic equity based portfolio. So we ran that through Merger Arb, we ran that, th the one, sorry, through the portfolio where we were um, either in a, s a separately segregated account or we were the seed investor or we were, um, um, but we couldn't do that obviously in, in a, a co-mingled fund. Um, and we ran that through our beta portfolio. So that was relatively easy. A bit harder where you're in a commingled fund. And, and that's, that's why it's useful. If you, for us, we work out the ingredients that work for us. And to the extent you can get your own segregated account, that allowed us to run things our way. Yeah. How are the objectives for Cobra and Firms different from hedge funds as in risk profile also, but the long-term objectives? Because most of the portfolio, as we see, is directed into equity, which is more uh, like the listed companies and the IPOs which are coming. But what part of technology, like when you are investing for 70, 80 years, what difference you are doing here yeah. rather than providing the other options? Yeah, well, so the sovereign funds obviously got a different horizon to the hedge fund. Um, if I think about the modern theory of hedge funds rather than the, the old Gordon Geckos, the new ones, um, they're... The ones that are becoming more successful, as I said, they're investing on data and technology that are looking for the alternate premium, which is hard for people to measure. So things away from traditional equity class, market classes where um, you can get that data and synthesize those uh, factor premiums fairly readily. They're collecting more proprietary data. Um, and as I said, we, we, are, we know several people um, or several managers who are collecting systematic data from words or written paper, written words from the written word, uh, and using those as part of their strategies. So, going to that question earlier, the, um, the classic merger up failure or merger failure, where you just got a board that will have that just doesn't want to talk to any potential acquirer, you don't pick that up systematically. It depends on the background of the directors and the chair. Um, but a good hedge fund will have that in a systematic way. But it depends more upon. Uh, the fund managers for sovereign funds, or it's more upon the country, or like what the country is interested in, like what where does the authority lie? Uh, well, every or sovereign fund's different, so every sovereign fund's different. If I've understood, so what's the motivation of each of the sovereign funds? Yeah, yeah each sovereign fund's got its own separate mandate. Um, some of those are shorter horizon, those are, some of those are longer. 
So the trick is you've got a bunch of managers doing their own thing at what they're good at, and you've got a bunch of sovereign funds. Each of them are different. Um, the trick is for us to find the ones that will best match the opportunity we identified. Okay, any other questions? Okay, oh well look, thank you for attending. Uh, it'll be remiss I should advertise the next one. So we will have an ESG focused um, FP uh, seminar, hopefully in August, I think. Um, I haven't got a date yet, but please um, check the website or sign up to the reminders, if you will. And uh, again, thank you for attending. Thanks.